Well, I'm Bob Schroeter. Uh, I came here as an undergraduate in October 1959 into the chemical engineering department, and really I've stayed here ever since. Uh, I became a member of what was a new group called the Physiological Flow Studies Unit, which was a postgraduate, postdoctoral research group. And I was very involved in that all my career, and uh, became the deputy head of that for a long period of time. And I have a chair, personal chair, in biological mechanics. And recently I've just sort of been slowing down as I come towards retirement, I've been senior tutor. My whole life has really been influenced by Imperial. Uh, I, I came here as a, as I said, as an 18-year-old undergraduate with all sorts of expectations, none of which were realistic, but um, funnily, I suspect a lot of them have been fulfilled. Uh, certainly in the peripheral areas of my life, my non-academic areas, all sorts of joys from climbing and rowing and uh, involved in the city of London and all sorts of things like that, uh, the history of this place, um, it, it's kept me going. Uh, the change in the way that things are done within the college has changed dramatically in recent years. Part of that is inevitable because if you're working and, and, and handling lots of people on, on one site or one institution, the bureaucracy of that has to be pretty heavy. But I am always very cautious of the fact that it may be becoming even more heavy than, than is healthy for an academic environment and for an institution. And I think that is what one of the big challenges for the future of college will be to maintain academic opportunity and a lightness of touch to enable academics to be innovative and to have the Imperial College can-do attitude, which is traditional in this college. When I was a, a younger child, I'd lived in Kent, and then I moved up to Durham when I was 11. And so I then returned to London. So London and the museums here in South Kensington were not new to me. Uh, I'd, I'd seen this before, so I didn't experience the, the difficulty of moving to London from far away. But nonetheless, it was, it was extremely daunting. You're coming to Imperial College, a place with dramatic history and reputation. In fact, I came to the City and Guilds College within Imperial College. I came to the engineering faculty, and, and that, as we all know, has, has its own tremendous reputation. And it made one feel very humble but very proud. And it made you feel very responsible and motivated as a student. Well, I arrived at Imperial at the end of 1959, which was the last year of the Waterhouse building. So I was lucky to see that building. But really, one tended to walk through it and walk through to the more modern building. The, the mechanical engineering building was, was right behind it. And so I spent a lot of time in that. The chemical engineering building the ACE extension had not been built then, but the, uh, the, the bone building was still there. Um, as the departments grew and as the activities grew, the, the new, new departments grew and buildings grew around it. Um, so I don't think it was too difficult to adapt, but it was, it was very challenging. It was very, it was very thrusting and, and you know, full of dynamism. I, I've been very lucky. I've been able to do the sorts of things and create the sort of world that I wanted to create. And, and as opportunities arose, one could use them and, and develop them. So for me personally, I, I've had a very, very enjoyable life here. In those days, all students got involved in the student life. Uh, I got involved in many ways. Um, I, I'd rowed at school, so when I came to college, I joined the boat club. And that had a long-term influence on my life. Uh, before I came to college, I'd climbed a lot, so I joined the mountaineering club. And uh, then when I went off on my first what they called freshers meet to North Wales. I, in the bus going up, I was sitting beside a chap who'd just come back from a mountaineering expedition to South America, and I thought that's a good idea, and uh, therefore became very involved in expeditions as well. So those sorts of social thrusts right, drove me very hard as well. Then after that, I became involved in the student union, uh, in, the, in the guilds union, first of all. Um, again, anybody who's full of beans and involved in clubs tends to get involved in these things. Uh, so it's a natural progression. I uh, think I became publicity officer, and then I was dragged into being union president. And uh, when I say dragged in, I, I was asked by everybody to do that job. They, either they couldn't find a candidate or whatever that year. But anyway, it was great fun. And, and uh, I was also vice president of IC Union in those days as well. I didn't um, take the jobs on because I had a plan that I had a crusade to undertake, but I think that I was um, actually 
very influential in making a number of changes within the guilds. Um, today we have all our departmental academic affairs committees and things, but we started that when I was union president. The academic affairs officers began in my year. Um, we also interacted as a student union very closely with the old students, the old Centralians, as it was. And the senior members of that were very um, friendly and, and helpful towards the student union. And we discussed many times with them what would be the best way of interacting. And out of that came the opportunity to establish the Old Centralians Trust, which is the, the charitable trust of the alumni. Um, and that has been supported financially over the years, and it does all sorts of things from uh, hardship support to first-class initiatives by students, and that was one of the things that we created. One of the roles that I was given as an academic well, was to head up the refectory services a long time ago. This was now. This was in the oh, what was it? <laughs> in the late 70s, I think it was. And um, Professor Aylon, Sam Aylon, had been the head of that for a while, and he'd done all the economic things that one had to do as a business manager, and, and had ended up in quite a lot of strife with the student union. I think he'd undertaken a lot of necessary developments, but uh, I was asked if I would take it on and, and try to improve the relationships with the student union. Well, one thing I do remember from my earlier student days was, was dinner in hall. Every Tuesday, the college held a formal dinner in hall, which was in the bite building, which was in the refectory, in the dining room on the first floor. And um, that was very popular. Uh, you had to sign up to it, and you often couldn't get in. But it was, it was a thing to bring girlfriends to, and sometimes supervisors would bring their personal students and personal tutees to it. Um, and it was a very good social mixing ground for, for students and staff. You could mix at all levels and, and in a very, very pleasant environment. And it was run by Miss Sherwood, Sherry, who was a, a most delightful lady who ran Bite Hall. She ran the, the women's part of the Hall of Residence. And she ran it with a, a rod of iron, very fiercely, but actually very lovingly. And uh, she was always keeping the, the male students away from the young ladies, but, uh, but at the same time with a, with a great tongue in cheek and a great smile on her face. I, I think the idea of dinner and hall worked very well in a smaller college. And I think it probably worked very well at a time when time itself was less pressurized. I'm saying that cautiously because I don't think the time is necessarily better used today, but, but uh, there doesn't seem to be a spare moment today in the way that there was some time ago. And I think that's a great loss to any institution because time for reflection and time for relaxation are very important. They're actually time for creativity. But uh, dinner and hall was of its time and there wouldn't be a place big enough to accommodate the same proportion of people that, that were represented in dinner and hall in the old days. And I think that's one of the college's big difficulties today, that there is no way collectively of bringing us all together with an intimacy that really makes good working relationships. It, the college has to respect the need to break down into subunits, whatever they may be. They may be the modern faculty system or they may be the old constituent colleges. I favor the old colleges personally very strongly, as I think everybody knows, but, but it, it, it's absolutely essential to, to break a massive grouping down into the granular uh, sort of generic form that you need. And, and that's what, as I say, one of the college's biggest difficulties. Yes, I, I think that the constituent college unions were, and still are, an absolutely key part to this fragmentation of the, of the integral imperial college from a student's perspective. And I suspect that's true also from an academic staff point of view as well, but certainly from the student's point of view, you have an affiliation which is really deep gutted to your, your, your craft. You're an engineer or you're, you're a physical scientist or you're a medic or whatever. And you learn by that, you learn two loyalties. You learn the loyalty to your, your particular discipline, but the integrated loyalty to the, the bigger Imperial College. And so I'm very strongly of the opinion that the constituent unions are all important in the success of the, the larger union and therefore the larger college. And the sometimes apparently crazy way that the constituent college unions live and operate is, is actually all part of the good fun of life. 
each of the, uh, the old traditional colleges had two mascots. One was the inviolate mascot, the Boanerges or Jezebel or Clementine the Lorry. But we've always had our uh, mascots which can be stolen or nicked or whatever you like to call it, um, which has been there to create rivalry between the colleges. And the City and Guilds College has always had a spanner, which is, a, I think, an understandable thing to have as a group of engineers. When I was president, I, I actually took over a union that had no spanner. It had been removed by the Royal College of Science. And uh, they had, I think quite naughtily, actually they drilled a series of holes across the spanner so that it was rather like a postage stamp. So when you picked it up, which is what engineers do with their spanner, it fell in two. <laughs> So the way to overcome that was to, that was a wooden spanner that we had before. I had a new one cast in bronze, uh, and it was a cast in a, a mixture of metals in, in the Bessemer building in the Royal School of Mines, which was a sort of one up on the, on the miners at the time. But we had a, a 70 pound spanner built. And uh, that was a bit of a mistake because Traditionally, the, the president of the union had always lifted the spanner up to do the war cry for the, the, the college thing, the union thing. So I had to lift up a 70 pound spanner. Well, I can actually do that. Well, I, I did it a few days ago, actually, but I can still do that. Um, but it's, I think it's very, one of the signs of being a president. <laughs> Unfortunately, most presidents since then have not actually lifted that spanner up. <laughs> but it, it, that, the, the current spanner of today originated in, in my year as president, and I, I always feel very proud about that. There, there was another very important cohesive um, grouping within, within the student unions, and that was the, what we call the tie clubs. There's the chaps club, the tutu club, and the links club, which is the, again, the engineers club. These really all began somewhat after the First World War, when students bonded in a very much more formal way, and they celebrated success amongst each other. And those Thai clubs have perpetuated through to today. The, the basic theme is still the same, that you look for people who are compatible and who are sportsmen in the broadest sense of the word, male or female now. Uh, it used to be all male, of course. But these Thai clubs bring together the, the movers and the shakers in, in the student societies and student groups within the different faculties or colleges. And that's another way, a cross activity of bringing people together, which is very stimulating and very rewarding. And I think an awful lot of the members of the Lynx Club and the other clubs have made their long, lifelong friends out of those clubs as much as out of the particular social activities that they were originated from. I, th I think the success of the Citizen Guilds College Association is, is to do with numbers and to do with the vitality of what that organisation has always offered its alumni, its members, and also the relationship between the old students and the current students. The idea of the Old Centralians Trust and giving help and giving advice has always been deeply embedded in, in current student life. And I think that's what has probably kept them very closely together. Um, what will happen in the future, I don't know, but uh, speaking from the, the old student association point of view, we are very determined that we will give our flavour of assistance to current students in a way that we jointly feel is appropriate, regardless of what the college may feel, but we have an independent axis of communication. We will always make that work. When I was a student, when I was an undergraduate student, um, I loved mountaineering and very quickly appreciated that one could go mountaineering in places other than just where the biggest mountains were, but that exploration itself was, was great fun and, and an opportunity whilst here at college. And there was a, a, a nascent exploration society in existence, and one of the things that I did when I was a student with other good friends, we drove that into a very much more effective club, the Exploration Society. And that was really there to stimulate people to go off on expeditions. And one of the great things that this college had was, and still is, a college-based committee to evaluate expedition proposals from students to give them the opportunity to be formally named Imperial College Expeditions. This is a thing called the Exploration Board, which is made up of college staff who know about expeditions and current students and old students, and they interview any prospective expedition and tear it apart logistically 
And if the student expedition can survive that, it will give it funds and put it, put the name of the board behind any applications the student makes to external support groups such as the Royal Geographical Society or, or charities or anything like that. The exploration board itself began in 1957 or 56 to help the Karakoram expedition, which was run by Keith Miller. Uh, that was a huge endeavor by the student union of the time. There had been, before that expedition, there had been one previous student expedition in 1938 to Yan Mayan in the Arctic. Nothing at all until this 57 expedition that Keith Miller got off the ground. And it was led by an external person, Eric Shipton, a very famous mountaineer. And the exploration board was there to help that expedition achieve its well, it's logistically there to support it. After that expedition finished, the exploration board stayed in existence. And that was a remarkably beneficial thing to have done by the college. It, it gave expeditions from students an opportunity to get support and, and to get advice. And that exploration board has continued through, as I say, until today. I think that one of the very important ways that the college paternalistically took an interest in the student unions and the life of the student community when I was a union president was that the rector of the time, Sir Patrick Linstead, always insisted on a weekly meeting with the union president. So once a week I would meet with him and we would go over all the issues that concerned us uh, in a very frank way and a very relaxed way and it was an opportunity to discuss matters that really worried one, knowing that they would be treated in, in, with genuine confidence and genuine concern. Now, I know that that relationship has gone on since those days, but I think it hasn't perhaps worked as intimately and as committedly as it did in Linstead's day. Paddy Linstead was a most remarkable man, and it was a great loss to the college when he died suddenly, as he did, because he just been the deputy chairman of a huge report, the Robbins Report on Higher Education, which is a report that brought out the concept of sisters, these special institutions of science and technology, education and research, I think it was. But Imperial was going to be the, the flagship of that, and an awful lot of the development that happened at Imperial around that time and immediately after resulted from that report. And I think that was the, the door opening to the, the modern college. It was all Linstead's doing. He was a most impressive man who was very humble, but very, very capable. In the days when, when Linstead was rector and, and we met on our weekly meetings, we'd do that always in the rector's office. And of course, that was in those days, that was in the Bight building. That wasn't in the Sherfield building because that hadn't been built by then. Uh, it was um, a delightfully um, old, nicely oak panelled environment to meet someone as senior as that, and it was quite intimidating for students to start with. But I, I think, as I say, Linstead was very good at breaking down these kinds of, of fear of young people, and he was always very gentle at the same time as being very demanding. And also his wife was a delight, Marjorie Linstead, and she was known by many as being a bit of a tyrant, but at the same time she had students welfare at heart, and, and she and I again got on very well. Uh, we had a good rapport. I think I was a cheeky student, but uh, I, she could see that I had genuine interest at heart, and, and we formed a very good friendship. I think an example of realizing just how sympathetic Linstead was uh, centered around a problem that I had when I was president with the sports day called Morphe Day. Um, Morphy Day traditionally consisted of the constituent colleges, particularly the, the RCS and the guilds, having a bit of a, 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 a sort of flower and tomato fight on the towpath whilst the, the three constituent colleges rode out the Morphy and the Lowry races on the river. The years before I was president, I'd actually been rowing on the river, but this year as president I had to take part in the fight on the towpath. And I always remember that there was a young policeman on one of those noddy early motorcycle bike things that he thought he was going to stop this, this rampaging on the, on the towpath. And so he very foolishly rode his motorcycle into the middle of the foray and got totally, but totally plastered in tomatoes and flour and everything else. And 
he was, in those days, I think a student, you could get away with making a, a monkey out of a policeman. You couldn't do that today. But I was petrified about what would happen. And I saw at the edge of all this foray, his boss, his superintendent was there. So I just went over to him. I said, look, I'm awfully sorry about all this. And I said, we'll obviously pay for all the cleaning up. And the policeman's response was, well, I think he's learned how to deal with crowd control, basically. <laughs> so he wasn't worried, but, but it was a great fear for us. And when I went back to college, I, I went to talk to the rector about it and said, look, I'm sorry, we may have had an incident which is not going to reflect well. And I explained it all to him, and he was very sympathetic, he was perfectly happy. He said, oh, he said, that's all right, they've, they've respected it. And we then somehow got on to his student days and how what they class as irresponsible life here at college in those days. But it, for them, they used to go and play football in Hyde Park. And I think the college archive somewhere has a photograph of, of Linstead playing football in Hyde Park. So you see this eminent rector in shorts kicking a ball around. Um, but to get to Hyde Park and back again, of course, they had to cross the main Kensington Gore. And they tend to do that in Crocodile and cause chaos for the traffic. So causing chaos for the traffic in the 1920s was just about as bad as doing it today. But, so I think that you learn pretty quickly that, that even eminent rectors have had a, a, a misspent youth. As I say, the, the main purpose of Morphy Day was not the fun and games on the towpath, which was designed to develop rivalry between the, the general student body. But it was really, Morphy Day was races on the river between the constituent colleges. There were two cups, the Morphy Cup and the Lowry Cup. The Morphy was the more senior. And I took part in that because I'd rowed at school and I, I loved rowing. But I discovered really that I couldn't row at college and go off on expeditions. And I'm afraid expeditions took, took precedence. So after a while, I stopped rowing seriously. But I never left my, or lost my association with, with the boat club. I always enjoyed rowing and I enjoyed coxing. And fairly quickly, I became involved in what we would call the old lags rowing, uh, which is the more senior citizens going up and down the river. And over the years, I, I would first of all row in that and then, then coxed boats. And then more recently, in, in 2000, just as the college was rebuilding the boathouse and expanding it and doubling its size, uh, I was asked to come back and take charge of rowing. It, it, as the chairman of the Boathouse Committee. What that means is the overall academic in charge of rowing at college. And that's been a great delight for the last few years in my sort of dotage. I've been working with Bill Mason, our chief coach, and Bill has got the most remarkable record that I think any coach in the country has of wins at Henley and, and promotion of international rowing and taking students who've never rowed before and turning them into the world's elite rowers. So it's been marvelous watching his leadership in that. And I think that my time has culminated really this last year at Henley. We were able to present a new cup for a new competition at Henley. And the history of that was that two years ago, the Henley stewards had decided to create a new race, which they called the Student Men's Coxed Fours, which was a race designed really to cream off men's university rowing from club rowing, because universities are actually the, the stronger of those two groups and it was unfair to clubs. So the, the new competition was set up. And of course, Imperial managed to win that in the first year. And as a result of that, I took that as a lever to say to the stewards, well, I think it's time for us to present a cup to, to Henley. No other university had been given that honor and Henley stewards agreed to us donating a cup. And the rector very kindly agreed to fund that. And we had a cup commissioned, which was presented this year and I asked for a a new design of cup to break away from the traditional mold, but not to be gimmicky. I didn't want a cup that would be looking out of place in 20 years' time. I wanted something which would reflect the power of imperial and, and the pleasure of rowing. And we were very fortunate to have a silversmith, Hector Miller, who has remarkable tradition of, of such um, commissioned work, to agree to take the task on. And this new cup was presented at Henley this year, and it was actually presented to the winning crew, and the winning crew just happened to be Imperial College. So we've really put our name on the cup twice now. And the presentation was by Jack Rogge, the president of the International Olympic Commission. So it was, it was done with great panache. And before that, the, the Queen had very graciously agreed to act 
as the, the, the go-between between us as college handing the cup over to the Henley stewards. We, we did that at, at the palace in early June with her and it was a most enjoyable um, audience with her for quite a long time with a lot of laughter and, and pleasure all around. Finding a name for the cup was not easy. Uh, obviously one would wish to say the Imperial Cup or something like that, but that of course is not an appropriate form of words for today. And what was agreed between us and the stewards was to call this the Prince Albert Challenge Cup. And that actually is a very mutually satisfactory choice of name because Prince Albert was the first royal patron of the regatta, that's why it's called the Henley Royal Regatta. And of course Prince Albert has got associations with the old and the current college which are ubiquitous. My academic life at college has, has really grown out of a dream that I had when I was a schoolboy. Um, when I was a schoolboy, I, I, like everyone wants to be a train driver, I went on from that to wanting to be a doctor. And uh, it was very strongly suggested to me by an uncle who I think had great prescience in the early 50s to say that if you go into medicine as a student, you'll probably end up as a GP. You won't do what you want to do, which is research you should really start as a chemical engineer and if that's successful and you still want to do medicine afterwards then you can do that as a postgraduate. So I duly applied to Imperial College to undertake chemical engineering as a, as a first degree and um, I then went on and did my PhD here and at that time I, I was feeling I wanted to go into medicine and the college at that time was just beginning to think about the idea of starting up a medical research group, which would be a multidisciplinary group. And that was, again, one of Linstead's brilliant ideas. He and the Royal Society research professor here at the time, Sir James Lighthill, really felt that this was an ideal time to bring engineering and science and medicine and biology all together, and mathematics, of course, which is his subject, uh, to, to, to look at biological and medical problems. And they, or James Lytle had had a long working friendship with Colin Caro, who was duly appointed the director of this in the end of 1966. And I joined that group straight away, right at the beginning. In fact, I, I joined it before it began, but um, was taken on straight away in, at the end of 1966. And uh, that's formed the basis of my academic career. I've been here throughout, first of all, in, in what we call the PFSU for short. And that then transmogrified into the Centre for Biological and Medical Systems, then the Department for Biological and Medical Systems, and now it's called the Department of Bioengineering. My, my work in the department, my, my academic work, has, has grown really from being interested in human respiratory disease at the beginning to realising that, in fact, if you look at animals as well as humans, you get a, a, a better picture of the big, big scene of things. And so my work has moved into animal research just as much as it's moved into human research. And so one of the areas it took me into very early on was, was to work with camels and to work out how it is that they can cope with the heat stress of the desert. And that led into some great fun. And, uh, an opportunity to travel, and, uh, which is something I've always done. My expedition days as student life have changed into being academic expeditions in my professional life. Um, but my work on camels was, was to do, as I said, with, with heat stress and, and how they can cope with the dehydration and the desert heat. And we demonstrated that there is a, a very special mechanism that operates in their head and in their brain to keep their brain cool at a time when their body gets very hot. And um, that work then ultimately led on to other things. It led on to being involved in horses and how horses cope with heat stress. And that led to being very intimately involved in the Atlanta Olympics in 1996. It, the conditions in Atlanta were expected to be very hot and very humid and devastatingly dangerous for, for horses and riders. And the International Equestrian Federation, the governing body for horse competitions was extremely anxious that there weren't horse deaths in Atlanta. So a couple of us got a, a major project thrust upon us to control the Atlanta Olympics from an equestrian point of view. And that led us into studying horses in stressful circumstances, 
arguing with the course designers about how the course should be designed and ultimately measuring the, the climatic conditions and having the responsibility of stopping the competition if necessary, if it got too hot. When we started the, the Physiological Flow Studies Unit, we were probably the first group in the world to bring together engineers, mathematicians, biologists, medics, and anybody else who could contribute to looking at problems on a truly equal interdisciplinary basis. And this was an approach that was revolutionary because we were not subservient to doctors having a problem saying, engineers, please solve. We were a group of people who took over basic problems and looked at them afresh. And that was something which was not even thought of in America at the time. We were ahead of the world in doing that. So people very often say to me these days, well, now that we have a medical school on board, uh, how has that helped you? And I have to say, well, it, it, it hasn't greatly helped us, but it hasn't hindered us. I, w I would admit that very happily. But our collaborations have been very largely picked from the most appropriate people around the world, not just in medicine, but in all the disciplines that can contribute to medicine and, let's say, biological mechanics of, of humans and other animals. So our work is not just the purview of, of the medical school, it, it, it's much broader than that. But now, now that I'm approaching retirement in the, 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 the very near future, uh, lots of colleagues, and particularly my wife, say, what are you going to do? Well, I think what I'm going to be doing is actually more of the same. Uh, I have a huge lot of research interests, which in the past have had to be dovetailed to my administrative and other responsibilities. From here on in, I have that very luxurious position of being able to carry on with very dedicated research students and, and research colleagues in the areas that fascinate me most. And those at the moment will be particularly on respiratory mechanics. But one or two other animal problems I have up my sleeve as well. I have a, a problem about looking at seals' whiskers and, and how seals <laughs> observe underwater, how they, how they can detect motion, how they can detect prey in the dark underwater. Um, because there's a lot of biofluid mechanics of, of, of that process that will be fascinating to look at.